Well, this morning we're going to close out our study in Romans 9. You want to go ahead and turn to Romans 9. We're going to begin at verse 30. As we look back on this particular chapter that we've gone over the last few times, Paul started it off with a sorrow in his heart, a sorrow in his heart for his kinsmen according to the flesh, which, were, which was the nation Israel, those Jews. He had a, he had a sincere sorrow for them, and that uh, he desired their salvation. They were lost. They, they, did, they did not look to the Messiah, the, the, the Christ of Scripture, for all of salvation. Instead, uh, instead, they went about to establish a righteousness of their own. But God promised to save all Israel. And in saying that, uh, there was... The Israelites thought that God was going to save every single Israelite or every Jew. And that Paul went through explaining all of these uh, things that he, he explained here in chapter 9, that, that that was not the case, that this Israel that God would save would be spiritual Israel, not every every Israelite, every Jew. And he went through giving some examples uh, uh, of Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And, of course, we know that Isaac was that child of promise. And, and Ishmael uh, was not saved. And then he gave the example of Isaac and, and Rebekah and those two boys, uh, Jacob and Esau. And he said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So he did all of that explaining that not every Israelite, when God says he's going to promise to save all Israel, that it's not talking about every single Israelite. And I'm not going to go through all these other things that led up to where we are today uh, in our study, but uh, uh, God brought in that uh, the, the Gentiles were going to be saved also. They were a part of spiritual Israel. And we closed out our last study uh, that we had the last time we, we were in chapter 9 with verse 29. Now verse 29 says, And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been, like, been made like unto Gomorrah. We see here in this verse, of scripture that God had never promised to save all Jews without exception. But he also did not determine to destroy all the Jews without exception. There was always and now is a remnant out of that nation according to grace. They are the remnant like the elect Gentiles are the seed, the spiritual offspring of Jesus Christ redeemed by his blood and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Look at Psalms 22 and begin at verse 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness. Well, that's exactly what we're doing this morning. We're declaring to this world Christ's righteousness before men. Uh, it says that they shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. And like I said, that's what we're doing this morning, declaring Christ's righteousness as the only ground and hope of a sinner's salvation. This remnant shall come to faith in Christ and repentance from dead works and form idolatry. From this revealed truth, God commands all without exception to believe his promise. His promise of salvation conditioned on Christ alone and to seek justification in life based entirely on what Christ accomplished in his work on the cross. This morning, we'll begin looking at a few verses where the Apostle Paul begins to tell us why the Gentiles 
which follow not after righteousness, attain righteousness. And Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Let's read Romans 9, beginning at verse 30 here, uh, the verses that we're going to go over this morning. Verse 30 begins, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, hath attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of law. For they stumble at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now let's look at Romans 9.30 here where it says, starts out, what shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? What conclusion should we draw from the great truths of God's grace in Christ, those truths that God has revealed up to this point as they relate to God also saving the Gentiles? The first statement here is that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness uh, is speaking of during the time of the Old Covenant. The Gentile nations, which is all the nations other than the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, were according to Ephesians 2, beginning of verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, these Gentiles, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, not a part of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God, in the world. Generally, the Gentile nations as a whole, as a whole, it says here in Romans 9.30, followed not after righteousness. They did not make an earnest and, and a sincere attempt to pursue a right relationship with the true and with the living God. They didn't know the true and living God. On the whole, they were lost in idolatry and total darkness, and did not have the light of God that he gave to the nation Israel under that old covenant. It is, not the, it, it is not that Gentiles had no law, or that Gentiles were not religious, or even somewhat moral. Look at Romans 2, beginning at verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The matter and substance of the moral law of Moses agrees with the law of light, the light of nature that God gives every man. And the Gentiles, in some measure, and in some way similar, they do by nature the things contained in the law. But the Gentiles did not have the light of the law of Moses, which was the schoolmaster given to the Jews to lead them to Christ. Moreover, the law being, a, being called a schoolmaster here shows, shows uh, that the, called a schoolmaster shows that the use of it was just temporary and its duration was just for a time. It was not to continue forever. Children are not always to be under a schoolmaster or a tutor. Therefore, the law was to continue and did continue to be used, be of use and service to the Jewish church until Christ came, who is the substance of it all. Christ, the substance of that old covenant law that was given to the nation Israel, which contained all of these things that God gave them having to do with the uh, sacrifices, the high priest, and all of these things, that pictures and types of Christ that should have uh, shown them their only hope of salvation. Look at Galatians 3.24. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, speaking of this uh, uh, Jewish nation, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Speaking of the Gentiles, let's look back at 9, 
uh, 30, the last part, where it says here that the Gentiles have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. He is ob obviously speaking of God's elect among the Gentiles because not all Gentiles, without exception, attain to this righteousness. Because or before these Gentiles heard the gospel, they were totally ignorant of Christ and his righteousness, didn't know anything about it. They enjoyed none of the special privileges that the nation Israel had and that they enjoyed. Some of these privileges are listed here in uh, Romans 9, verses 4 and 5, that I'm not going to read, but you can look at them up on the screen here. And all these privileges that, that they had that God gave them uh, to, as, he, if he, as he sent the Messiah in time, all of these things that, that in pictures and types reveal Christ and his work of redemption. On the whole, the Gentiles' sinfulness was open and it, it was evident to all. They were active idolaters and abandoned to every kind of wickedness. There could be no doubt in anyone's mind that these Gentiles had nothing in them to recommend them to God. They had met no conditions and had no qualifications for salvation. They did, however, attain righteousness. How? They attained it by faith and not by the works of law. Faith looks to and freely receives the righteousness Christ worked out by his death on the cross. Faith believes and rests in Christ and his obedience unto death as our complete and only righteousness before God. That's what faith looks to. It is not that our faith, it is not that our believing is our righteousness, but that Christ, the object of our faith, Christ is the person in whom we believe. He is our righteousness. We look to him, and we don't look to our faith. We just got through seeing how the Gentiles in Romans 9.30 have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. They look to Christ by faith. Now we'll begin to look at Israel. Not all of Israel, but the vast majority of that nation. We'll see how that they followed after the law of righteousness, as it were, by works of law. Let's look here in our next verse, verse 31. It says, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained. To the law of righteousness. Israel, however, who had the law of Moses, they had the law of Moses, and followed after the law of righteousness. They sought after, pursued it with passion and with zeal. We're going to see that as we start out uh, the 10th chapter here in Romans, uh, the book of Romans. But they speaking of Israel, had not attained to the law of righteousness. They pursued it. They sought after it, but they didn't attain it. What is it to come short of the glory of God? It's to come short of the righteousness. And this coming short of the glory of God here is in Romans 3, 23 here, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what is it to come short of it? It's to come short of the righteousness that God requires. That's what it is to commit sin. It is to come short of the glory of God, and God's glory is perfectly displayed in the person and work of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of God displayed in Christ and his perfect satisfaction to God's holy law and inflexible justice. Israel as a whole fell short of Christ's righteousness, and instead, looking by faith to Christ alone for righteousness, they chose to pursue righteousness by their law-keeping, by their deeds of law. And Scripture says in Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Let's continue to look at God's standard of judgment, whereby he will judge the whole world. Acts 17.31 says, Because he hath appointed, God appointed the day in which he'll judge the whole world in righteousness by that man, speaking of Christ, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. That's that standard of judgment, the Lord Christ. 
Do you have this righteousness by which God will judge all men, whether Jew or whether Gentile? Do you have this righteousness that is spoken of here in this scripture? If you do have it, how did you get it? Is it a righteousness that you worked out by your law keeping? Or did God enable you to work it out through the help of the Holy Spirit? Was it done by you or in you in any way? If you answer yes to any of these questions, then my friend, you're, and the scripture says this, ignorant of God's righteousness, and you're going about to establish a righteousness of your own. You've not submitted yourself to the only righteousness by which God will save a sinner. Look at Romans 10, beginning at verse 3. For they being, speaking of that nation Israel, ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. See, if you don't know anything about the only way that God will justify a sinner, and that is Christ's righteousness alone, his perfect satisfaction to God's law and justice. If you're ignorant of that, as far as this righteousness is your, that he worked out, perfect satisfaction, and imputes it to all those that come to him by faith, okay? If you don't know anything about that, you're ignorant of it, or not submitted to it, then you're going to go about to establish a righteousness of your own. You know that you're a sinner. We, we see we're sinners by nature. We, we see that. We know that we fall short. We know that there's a problem here, that, that we're going to have to face God at judgment. And what we do by nature, because we're ignorant of the only, only thing he'll accept, God will accept, we'll go about to work it out. And that's what they were doing by deeds of law. They were going about. They were not submitted uh, to, to the only ground by which a sinner would be saved. They went about to establish one of them. Now, we're talking about the nation of Israel, but we're talking about every man when we say these things. All of us, by nature, as we come to this world, that's what we do. We go about to establish the righteousness of our own. We hear it from the pulpits all, all, all over the world, not only from the pulpits, but we hear it from our parents as we're raised up, most of us. Not all of us. Some of us are fortunate and that we have believing parents, but for the most part, most of us are raised like that. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you say, Jim, I have no righteousness of my own, and that all my righteousness are filthy rags, and that the righteousness that I have is Christ's righteousness alone, the righteousness that Christ worked out and freely imputed it to my account, charged it to my account. If you say your righteousness is in heaven and is even at the right hand of the Father right now, if you say that the righteousness that I have is one that God the Father has already accepted, he accepted it and that the Father raised Christ from the dead, as it says in Acts 17.31, then, my friend, if you're among this last group of individuals, you, according to Romans 9.30, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. We look to Christ. Believers look to Christ alone for righteousness in life. We don't look to our works in any way, whether it's what we think we're doing or God is enabling us to do. We look to Christ for all of salvation. Once again, the nation Israel as a whole and like all men by nature, we fall short of, the, of God's standard of righteousness. That standard of righteousness that we just got through talking about here, this description of those that do not attain to righteousness does not describe every individual Jew, but it does describe the vast majority of the nation Israel as a whole. Paul himself was an Israelite, but he himself had, according to Romans 9.30, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. We could say the same thing about Peter, John, James, and other Jews in the New Testament, and also many of the Jews in the Old Testament, as Moses, David, Isaiah, and many, many others. They attained to righteousness. 
but it was not by their deeds of law. It was as they looked to Christ, the object of that faith, for all of salvation. In any given time in history, the believing Jews, they were a small part, a remnant of that nation, but they were believing Jews. However, the nation as a whole fell short. Romans 9, 32 and 33 starts out, wherefore? Why? Or why did the nation as a whole fall short? And why did they not attain to the law of righteousness? Well, it says, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of law. For they stumble at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in sign a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Speaking of Christ, they stumble at that stumbling stone. Why did the nation as a whole not attain to the law of righteousness? Romans 9.32, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law. Here God, the Holy Spirit, by the Apostle Paul, gives us a reason why sinners, not only the Israelites, but why sinners do not attain unto righteousness. And in doing so, he places the entire responsibility on sinful, self-righteous, unbelieving sinners. In the case of Romans 9, 32 and 33, he's speaking specifically of the unbelieving Jews here. But it can be applied to unbelieving Gentiles as well, all other people. Paul did not say that the Jews did not attain to righteousness because they were not elect. It was because they did not seek it by faith or they did not seek it in the person and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of self-righteousness and because of national and religious pride, they insisted on attaining righteousness before God by their efforts to seek the law, to keep the law, which is seeking salvation by your works. Then in the last part of verse 32, Paul speaks of that stumbling stone and rock of offense that became a snare to those Jews. This was Christ, who is the only righteousness believing sinners can and must have to stand before God without blame. Romans 9, the last part of verse 32, says, For they stumble at that stumbling stone. This is a direct quotation from Isaiah 8, verse 14, which says, And he shall be a sanctuary for some, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for again and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This, of course, is a prophecy of Christ and the great work he would accomplish on behalf of God's elect, both Jew and Gentile. He would accomplish on behalf of God's elect, and the prophet Isaiah says here that Christ would be a sanctuary. He's going to be a sanctuary for some, a place of refuge for his people in all the time of distress. And who is their dwelling place? He's our dwelling place. He dwells in us, and we dwell in him. And he is a sanctuary wherein we dwell safely and securely. No other safe place but in Christ. No other secure place but in Christ. Christ is a sanctuary to worship in. Christ in whom we draw nigh to God the Father. As concerning Christ being a stumbling stone and a rock of offense to the house of Israel, it is referring to the elders of the people of Israel, those priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, all who sought to entangle Christ in his talk and to ensnare him by questions they put forth to him, but were themselves snared and silenced. The following quotation from nine from Romans nine thirty three, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This scripture is taken from Isaiah twenty eight sixteen, which is another prophecy of Christ, and that particular scripture reads, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, 
a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not be, make haste or not be disturbed or worried or concerned about his salvation. Paul proves that the Jews did not attain righteousness because of their rejection of Christ, who is the only righteousness, the only righteousness that God requires, and the only righteousness that God will accept. Christ's righteousness alone is the only righteousness that believing sinners can and must have as they stand before the true and living God, who is a, a just God and a Savior. Let's look at Romans 1, beginning at verse 16. We're all familiar with these verses here wherein Paul speaks of the gospel that he's not ashamed of or reluctant to preach. It said, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, for therein this gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, those that are just before God shall live by faith. Also, Romans 3, beginning at verse 21 here, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, by his faithfulness unto all, it's preached out to all, and it's upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of that's in Christ Jesus. Also look at Romans 10 verse 4. And you know in, in, in as we begin in chapter 10, it, he starts out about his desire and prayer for Israel that they might be, be saved. He said, I bear them witness they have a zeal of God that's not according to knowledge. But then in verse 4 here he, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's the fulfillment of it. If we would find and have righteousness, a right standing before God, we must find and have Christ alone. Christ is a stumbling stone for all who insist on righteousness by their works, by works of law. Look at 1 Peter 2, beginning of verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in sign a corner, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them, which stumble at the word, being disobedient, unbelief, whereunto also they were appointed. Christ is a rock of offense to all who seek salvation by the works. But then in the last part of verse 33, we're told that all those that do look to Christ for all of their salvation will not be ashamed. They won't be ashamed now nor will they be ashamed throughout eternity. In the last part of verse 33, it says, And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed or confounded. Let's look at another scripture that gives us this same pass a message. Look at 1 John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, speaking of Christ, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he's righteous, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. 
What in the world is it to do righteousness? It's to look to Christ for all of your salvation. See, that, that's what Abel was doing when he brought that sacrifice. That's what he was doing. That sacrifice would point it to Christ as his only hope for salvation. That perfect sacrifice without spot or blemish. He looked to Christ for all salvation. That's what it is to do righteousness. Christ is the one and only solid rock of salvation to all, whether they be a Jew or Gentile. All who believe on him have their trust in him, their hope in him. All who appear before him, before God in him, shall be declared righteous. And they won't be declared righteous by their works, not by their works, but by the merits of Christ's obedience unto death. Righteousness before God is a matter of grace and mercy, not merit in the sinner. All who appear before God without him, without Christ, shall be exposed and confounded. To the question which is the title of our message this morning, what shall we say? Let us all say with the Apostle Paul, as in Philippians 3, beginning at verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, worthless, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith, the faithfulness of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen.